Dave, please come on up. Please give Dave a warm welcome. Thanks, Linda. Uh, thanks for an awesome presentation, um, Andrew. I wish I'd had that book 10 years ago because um, I've had to do a lot of this from first principles. As, uh, as you'll see, there's um, some sort of hard-won um, thinking behind all of this. And you'll see uh, the red pill and the blue pill up there. Anybody uh, a fan of The Matrix as a movie? Yeah, which pill do you want to take? The red, the red pill is the one you want to take. So that's the conversation between Morpheus and Neo where Neo says, well, I'll take the red pill and go down the rabbit burrow and see how far we can go with all of this. So half an hour of pretty fast-paced um, IT operating model stuff. So I'm not going to labour the point too much about digital um, because there's been so much fantastic content on that over the last couple of days. It's all happening is all I could say about that. Um, and IT managers could be forgiven to be a little bit overwhelmed. Yeah. So the, the pace of technology change is accelerating away from our management capability because we're relying on principles and practices maybe from last century still. So, so we've, we've, we've got a little bit to catch up on. And if I talk to some research analysts, they might tell me that bimodal is an answer. And it is an answer, of course. It's, a, it's an operating model. It's an approach. Um, but it kind of misses the point of the transformational opportunity that's in front of us at the moment. So we just divide it up into the cool, funky team that gets to do all the new stuff, and then we've got the old legacy people with the legacy systems. It's kind of one of the implications of this, which I don't particularly like. Um, and I was there, and a few of you probably got enough gray hair to remember the Y2K thing, right? So we were all there back in 99, 2000, reinventing our IT function around e-commerce and also trying to get rid of, you know, watch out for this Armageddon event that was going to happen um, on my birthday, actually. It was 31st of December. Uh, I think, can't remember what age I was. I'm trying not to remember, probably. So Armageddon, that didn't happen. And then we did uh, the e-commerce thing at the same time. But the real question, I think, was, well, how do we change faster? How can we become more adaptive as an IT function uh, to meet the needs of the business? So how do we change faster, and what does the destination look like? So I guess we could look back to our traditional frameworks and, and, and sort of look for guidance there. But uh, I don't want to labor the point too much, but most of these frameworks were written in the last century for last century's problems. And so some things in there are timeless, like incident, problem, change, release, config. A lot of the taxonomy of the modern IT function is derived from principles from managing bureau computing in the 80s and 90s. So there's some timeless concepts there, but Netflix, Amazon, and uh, Google don't use ITIL. They use something that they've created to match their own business models. Yeah? So they've, they've gone with what is going to work for them. And they moved away from a call-centric model. You try and get a phone number off any of their websites, you'll struggle to find that. They've got some sort of omni-channel model, but they drive it out of a continuous operations sort of idea rather than, well, when things break, they'll, somebody will call the service desk and we'll have N levels of support behind that. So they're, they're, the mental model of IT is quite different. Um, COVID, for example, as, as another example of a framework, I was quite excited when that came out, plan, build, run, monitor, and we've got the little hat of ISO 38500 sitting on the top of that. Pretty cool, but very useful as an, as an audit um, tool or as a controls framework that sits with an operating model. It's not an operating model itself, although it tries to do a lot of the, uh, the, the functionality of an operating model in giving you racy charts, the, uh, the KPIs, the connections between processes up and down the life cycle. It does some pretty cool stuff, but it's not an operating model. ISO 20000, yep, that's, uh, that's currently being redeveloped. Uh, and various, actually, one of the things I would observe is that there's nothing wrong with good old-fashioned project management. It still has a place, particularly if you're standing up a new platform, building a data center. You don't do agile to do those things. So there's a fitness, fitness for purpose test on a lot of these frameworks. But the challenge is that best practices arrive after you need them. If you look at the, the, the pace of change that we're, we're going at at the moment, and look at the, the sort of revision sort of history of the various frameworks that we've been relying upon, um, you can't kind of look back there for guidance because it's not coming with you. So 
what have I been doing about this over the years, I guess. You know, just, I, I came up with this idea of, I think I called it an operating framework. This is the first one I did back in 2003 for a company called CSR. They make building materials. Um, so that was my first go at it and trying to understand um, management processes, service functions and service processes. It was an attempt. Um, I had another go at it with this one. Um, I can't remember where I did this one, but the, uh, the ideas of governing the services lifecycle and managing the IT business, that occurred to me around that time. And I V3 sort of had a little bit of influence on that, starting to think of IT as a business. Um, I did this at one of Australia's big four banks. Um, it's another, another um, attempt. Business demand drives supply of IT services through processes executed by our workforce and governed by controls. That's had, had some logic to it, um, seen to work. Um, this is uh, another, another way of looking at it, management capabilities, um, uh, organizing the resources to deliver the service portfolio out to the customer, another way of looking at it. Um, then I put together some training called Emerging Frameworks in the IT Operating Model, boom, 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 boom. That was another evolution. And you'll note service lifecycle, phases and processes, very ITIL-centric language. That's was, that was the source. Um, oops. This one, that's actually where I met Charlie Betts when I put this one up on SlideShare. It got tweeted around a little bit, and Charlie said, those things are not processes, they're capabilities. Oh, we had this whole capability discussion. Um, but I came up with the idea of the minimum viable system at that point as the minimum things that you would need to do to have a complete feedback loop or to have a complete system. So I'm going to need to talk to a customer, I'm going to need to define stuff, and I'm going to have to build stuff and bring it into production, do all of those sorts of things. So, so that model um, made some sense. Um, and it's kind of got an inherent value stream sort of organizational approach in there. This one was for a large, um, a large financial services organization. The new thinking in that one was the digital delivery model at the top, build, operate, transfer, where you'd have a digital agency out there building new stuff, operating it for a period of time with the same taxonomy and tools, and then transferring it to the new IT organization that would look after it. Um, this one I did for a, um, for a, a, a mortgage um, organization, a, a mortgage broker. Um, and you'll see that I broke the portfolios into the internal and external. The organizational model for the external IT services was, was product and platform based. Yeah, so it was a, a, a product-based value stream design uh, for the product team. And that seemed to work well. Um, they did the structure around that, the tools. They changed their sourcing model um, to put the source outsourcer actually on the internal IT services and they did everything to do with their um, new product, their customer facing product, they did that internally themselves. So that was interesting. Um, that's, uh, that was part of the, uh, that was uh, a high level visualization of the operating model when Penguin and Random House Books came together in Asia Pacific. So I led the transformation of the IT function there. And then last but not least, I had a bit of a laugh when I found this one in my collection of operating models. Um, this was a very large, um, news organization uh, that um, had a, a, a video and content development uh, part of its business called the, I think it was the digital and content business unit. And so I had to t think about a portfolio of products in that case and supporting platforms. And this was 2013. They were already way ahead of the pack because of course if you're in the news media, you needed to reinvent yourself not this year but many years ago because that existential crisis of who are we, what are we about, that happens in the news industry yeah, probably seven, eight, maybe even 10 years ago. So what did I observe along the way of doing those things? Plan, build, and run is not an operating model, which is what Andrew was saying. They're life cycle phases, but people organize around that and wonder why the head of infrastructure and operations is saying, I'm not allowed to talk about the fact that I actually plan, build, and run things in my function all on my own. I've got to be quiet about that. It's not my job description, but I've got to do it because the architects don't do it. They don't know anything about the infrastructure. So I've got to do that. So there's a lot of contention and confusion caused by just saying plan, build, run is the operating model. The operating model is more than the structure. And I've seen large consultancies go into organizations and give a new structural view or a functional view of the world and say, here's the new operating model. Not really. Okay, there's a lot of other stuff that we need to do. Governance controls should not be separate very frustrated doing Sarbanes-Oxley work for a little while and finding that people were getting technical writers to come in and write processes and all of this sort of stuff that had no connection to reality in the processes the real work people were doing. Don't like that. That's waste. 
independent, independent culture change programs don't. They don't change much at all, right? So I'm going to do a leadership development program, I'm going to do a culture change program. Why? What's it connected to? What's the outcome or the change in behaviour you're going to need that's going to drive the business outcome out of your operating model? You can't do these things independently well. Framework du jour initiatives don't deliver, so we're going to go and do this particular um, framework that we've picked up at a conference, and I'm just going to do DevOps, or I'm just going to do Agile, or you know, uh, some you know cybersecurity approach. They've got to be connected. Yeah, isolated, functionally based improvements don't give you the bigger outcome that you're looking for. So, an independent initiatives from uh, issues. Sorry, initiatives independent of the service portfolio don't really work. So what I mean by that is I'm going to, I'm going to go and improve my manufacturing and plant and machinery, but not thinking about the product and uh, the value propositions that Andrew was talking about. So we've got to really think about the portfolio of things that we do to drive the operating model we need, which I'll get to in a bit more detail. And leaders love the idea of this. Um, but they struggle to design their own model. There's no silver bullet answer for the operating model. It's pretty hard work. And the last thing, but I tell you what, if I talk to a business person about this, they'd say it's probably the most important, is nobody cares enough about flow. The flow of value from left to right, yeah? If you talk to a, a manufacturing organisation about all of this and you didn't mention the throughput you're getting, yeah, for the investment that you're making in all of this plant and machinery, how many cars can I make with that? Well, I don't really know, but it looks nice, right? So we've got to think about the flow of all of this. So there's some things that are behind the models I'm about to show you. So I have a very service portfolio-centric view of the world, um, which Andrew was talking about, the value propositions that IT delivers, the traditional and the digital, thinking of those together, yeah? It's really super important. So. You'll see, in fact, business strategy, IT strategy and governance, technology and sourcing roadmaps are essentially strategy to portfolio in IT for IT. And I kind of happened across that just through, I don't know, just through experimentation, I came to the same conclusion. Then I need to worry about leadership and culture, organisational design, the engagement model and demand management, super important. We go to market as IT, but we don't think about how we're going to engage and how we're going to shape filter and execute on the demand. Yeah? What resources do we need? How much capacity do we need? Those sorts of things. We just get started with plan, build, run. Yeah? And we do that from an architectural level, but not really from a business level. The next thing is service brokerage and partner integration. Of course, we're sourcing from many different places. We're brokering some things in um, and that are fairly pure. It might be fairly simple to do. Other things will need to be integrated. Partners need to be integrated. Certain technologies we're consuming need to be integrated. Then, of course, value streams and capabilities. You'll see R to D, R to F, and D to C there. Measurement, improvement, management tools and automation, and governance. These are all the things we've got to get in balance if we're going to have an effective operating model that's going to deliver that service portfolio. So this is a bit of a design challenge for us. So I guess you might be, uh, might be wondering how we might go about that. We'll get to that in a tick. I would like to propose, and I, you can see my clip art skills at the right there, that's actually what it looks like. Um, <laughs> continuous delivery is kind of where we're going with a lot of this, and continuous delivery and everything as a service. But I'm kind of focusing a little bit here on from the idea to the value, yeah? How are we going to do that? The connection of lean, the ideas of lean startup, agile, um, IT service management and continuous operations working together in synchronous flow with the customer. Yeah, and so this is, this is the part that, that is the differentiating capability in our organisation. This is the bit that the digital team is working on at the moment, trying very, very hard to deliver on that. So that's coming. We'll see our organisations tend towards that. That being the case, we know that we should be thinking about the flow. The first way of DevOps, Gene Kim's uh, two books up there, understanding the work from left to right. If we don't understand how the work flows across our organisation, we're going to struggle. And the second way, shorten and amplify feedback. As a long time um, ITIL consultant, and even before that, a quality consultant around ISO uh, 9000 and uh, TQM and those sorts of things, um, feedback has always been a bit mysterious. When do you get the feedback? Do you get it at the end of the year, the end of the month, the end of the week? 
And the trick is, if you're building cars, so you'd, you'd find this quite easy. Well, before the car rolls off the end of the production line, I need to know whether this thing's going to be OK. So the feedback has to be in the cycle with the thing that's being developed. And then we get more feedback later when it's in production. But this is really important that we shorten and amplify the feedback. A culture of continuous learning and experimentation is also ex extremely important. Why wouldn't we do this for the whole IT function? Please give me an argument why we wouldn't worry about these things across the whole organization. I break these into flow, feedback, and freedom. Yeah, they're the things that we need to be focusing on. So, so that's, that's an extremely important part of our, our, our path forward. Understanding value streams and how to optimize these is extremely important too. Now, the, tr the trouble with things like um, ITIL 27 processes and five functions and COBIT, I think it's 40-something, various other models, is that you could build all of these independent, thing, independent processes and never know whether you're getting the outcome that you need. When you focus on value streams, which is what you do in the DevOps and continuous delivery world, you say, well, how long should it take? We should be able to turn this around in a day. OK, cool. So how long can this thing sit in a queue? Minutes, not hours, not days. How long can it, does it take for actually uh, processing? And what sort of error rate should we be designing this for? So if we use this as the construct around which we do our design of the things we do for the business, we're going to be in good shape. That's why I was so excited when I ran into um, IT for IT with a value stream based model. Awesome. The other thing that we also need to understand is that our services are not as simple as they used to be. So this is an example from Johnny Woolridge, um, CTO of a company called Cambridge Satchel. They make satchels, they're from Cambridge. Um, pretty straightforward. Um, but what, they, what they've done in, in this example is to say, well, at the front end where the basis of competition is, where the value proposition is all around the customer experience, we're going to move that in a continuous delivery model. And then at these other layers of that service, we'll move as slowly or as fast as we need to to underpin what we're trying to do at the front end. So when we're categorizing our services, we have to be a little bit careful not to say, well, uh, look, of course, the banks have figured this out. If you look at the mobile apps that are connected to core banking systems, the mobile apps are actually moving at high cadence. No problem. They're decoupled via APIs. They're risk managing that whole thing. So this is how organizations are already starting to think about it. Yeah but hard to design an organizational model around that. There's some complexity. So I look at IT for IT as the unifying framework for the traditional and the digital. We might need to instantiate some of these value streams more than once. Yeah, I might need to have one that does the digital portfolio and looks at continuous delivery and continuous operations. We need to operate like Netflix in this part of the portfolio. And that might attract some slightly different tools and practices and taxonomy yeah, that we've got to deal with because we might be dealing with a part of our organization that's quite attached to the way it works and thinks. But we need to have a backbone underpinning all of that. So there is no need to think of this in a, a different way for digital. It it's, sits quite well within this sort of framework. So IT for IT in that regard is the backbone of flow. And it goes down to enough levels to be very helpful for us at the design of the artifacts for processes and tools, et cetera. So, so a, very, uh, a very useful guide in a way that has not been done before in any of the other frameworks. So based on my, my frameworks experience and my operating model experience, I thought, well, better, uh, better organize this IT for IT into something that I can consume within the operating model construct. And so added a few things to it. You'll see the service integration and operations management, platform management, technology business management, and ICT governance as capabilities an organization needs to have. Now, if you look at back at, Port, back at Porter's value uh, chain, they're called activities. But in this context of an operating model, I think they're actually capabilities that are supporting capabilities for those four value streams across the top. Make sense? Yeah? Um, and from there, you can actually do quite a lot of stuff. So I can go through and do a rating of my organization based on that legend on the bottom right there. It's functional and integrated. It's functional but decoupled. Uh, there's a functional gap. In some cases, you might not evaluate a particular part. 
Um, but I've used this very, very quickly with CIOs and executive uh, teams of IT to say, here's your report card on a page. And they very, very rarely uh, question too much about this because they kind of know, yes, we think about things in a very functional way. We don't really sort of think about the, the flow of value uh, from left to right across the organization. So typically when I give them their report card and then start to organize these things into a future state, people are fairly comfortable whilst they know there's going to be some pain. <laughs> they understand intellectually that this is the right thing to do, but there's some pain coming. One of the ways that, that I've found useful to, uh, to help with, with the, 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 clar the clarity of this whole thing is to actually map all of the current tools that you're using onto the components of IT for IT. So, well, some of these things we're going to remove, we kind of know that. Um, we've got some things that we know are not quite right for our organization, but we're gonna, you know, we're gonna persist with them for a, a while because we maybe have got a contract, a licensing sort of arrangement for the next couple of years. Um, and you'll see uh, that some, some tools are actually working quite well, and a lot of organizations have got service desk incident problem change, knowledge management, a portal, and some of those things could be working quite well, if a little bit independently of what's going on upstream. So, so this is a really nice way of organizing your tools roadmap. And actually, it was quite interesting. I was in a steering committee meeting for a transformation program my team's working on, and the head of operations said, I didn't know your program was actually working with operations and going to disturb my tooling. I said, well, we're talking service management over here, and your operations stuff does actually connect to that fairly, you know, <laughs> fairly um, intimately. But yeah, it was, it was a mystery uh, to that particular individual. So, so one of the things that I thought was useful in starting to look at this is, well, how would I define the maturity journey of the operating model then? What would that look like? So I thought about the plan, build, run model and how I might, uh, how I might sort of describe that. So in a plan, build, run organization, I've typically got some sort of inventory of services. Um, I understand that there is a life cycle. I've got some tooling in place, typically de decoupled. There's a CapEx funding model. Um, I've got some functional measures in place. I measure the things that I do within the functional areas, and I, I'm seeing or observing some fairly functional or sort of local behaviors. And then if I followed the logic of, of various frameworks, I would start to couple these things together, yeah? And I would start to basically do what IT for IT would suggest, is start to look at these things as value streams rather than functions. And so I'll put the, the various patterns and frameworks, some of which I might get a, a chance to have a look at with you. Um, engagement model in place, service backbone established, et cetera, et cetera. So at the top level there, we're operating digitally. Yep. So what is that? You know, is this a bit of digital washing? Well, I, I'm, I'm sort of envisioning, we're not there yet, but a, a time where we manage all of our portfolio in a very consistent way and give a very consistent and awesome customer experience to our external customers and deliver a great outcome for our business process uh, sponsors and stakeholders and our end users. So all of that can work together. And there's a bunch of metrics, of course, oh sorry, most enterprise IT is down in the first one, yeah? So I'm trying to create a little bit of tension here to <laughs> maybe move up a little. So, so the, the metrics that I think are worthwhile looking at, I'm not gonna read them all out, but the value stream based met metrics are gonna be super important for us. At the end of it, we want to be looking at customer experience, flow metrics, um, life cycle value optimization, and optimizing the value we're getting out of our suppliers. So this is, this is perhaps uh, where we can head. So what, the, what might this look like um, for your organization? And I, I'm extremely excited about you know, the, the way um, Tesla is evolving as an organization. If you look at the Roadster, the S, the X, um, the three, the Y, the truck, all of those sorts of things, you're seeing the supply chain evolve with the product. Couldn't be clearer, yeah? The backyard approach to doing the, 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 the Roadster with the, the Lotus and the bits and pieces of, 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 of batteries and, and gearboxes they try and all of that sort of stuff, a very garage days sort of experience, yeah? They just sort of put it together and then all of a sudden they, they figured out they had to, to build a few of those Roadsters for the people that paid a couple of hundred grand or whatever it was to reserve one. 
Um, but the, th the whole thing was just hanging together. I think in, the, in Ashley Vance's uh, biography of, uh, of Elon Musk, they talk about things actually being held together with magnets and, and, and blue tack and stuff like that. The, the roast that was on the stage in, in pieces, essentially, right? So, but if you're going to get out there and, and, and do several hundred thousand Model 3s, all of a sudden you're building gigafactories, you're putting it into locations all around the world, et cetera, et cetera. So you're changing your operating model to suit the product and the volume of that that you need to produce. So what do we need to do? So um, those of you familiar with um, Simon Sinek's Start With Why, there might be a few about. Yeah, you recognize this, um, this golden circle. Um, I keep thinking golden triangle, but it's obviously circles. Um, why, how, and what? So the modern IT function. Now, I was talking to a, an insurance company in Brisbane the other day, and I said, so tell me the why of your organization. And in their case, they said, we're a software company that sells insurance products. And I went, wow, OK. You're a software company that sells insurance products. That's going to be a very different conversation than if you are making cars or digging coal out of the ground or whatever it is, right? So, so Philosophically, they are oriented towards the IT business and IT use case. So, you know, their how will be quite different than another organization's how, and the what down the bottom there will be quite different as well. We have to start with that why, because that gets us in touch with the values of our organization and their purpose and intent, right, our business. And that's extremely important. Otherwise, we'll be saying, let's just implement IT for IT. And we'll go down the same problem that we've been doing for the last 20 or so years of all of these frameworks. Which chapter are we up to in the book? Where am I in the table of contents of ITIL, COBIT, ISO 20,000, 27,001, whatever it is, yeah? That's the challenge that we have. We don't want to go there again. We want to start with why, think about how, and then we think about what. So what does that look like? So all of these dimensions somehow need to be reconciled. And it looks like this. So we'll start with understanding the configuration drivers of our organization. So what is our business strategy? What is our current state service portfolio? What is our, our sourcing model? All of those things are, are, are going to be very important for us to understand our service portfolios and families and the attributes of all of those things. And if we don't do that, we're going to struggle. I saw uh, Commonwealth Bank and EDS back in the day, 1997, when they first outsourced, had, had very, very difficult lives together because they'd done all of the attributes of the retail bank and, as part of the deal, but they hadn't looked at the institutional bank, the equities trading part of the organisation, et cetera, et cetera. So I figured out that this was kind of important. So from there, I can start looking at various patents to say, well, maybe I need to think about Siam. I might think about DevOps in terms of some of my value streams. I might go look for an ERP for IT that will actually satisfy the whole left to right, or I might say, well, I need some best of breed here and there. So I'm starting to think about patents and frameworks that will serve my why and the operating model, uh, sorry, the service portfolio attributes. From there, I'll start to design capabilities for the next level down, and then I'll get to my what, yeah? That's when I, I start to actually understand the roles and responsibilities and all of those sorts of good things that we need to do. I'm sorry I'm going so fast. And, and Mark Smalley said to me, this is more of a master class than it is 30 minutes, but um, <coughs> there's plenty of time to catch up over the next day or so. So, so the other thing is, well, I've got this idea of a service family, and it might be end user services, our ERPs, our line of business um, services. It could be platform based. There are various attributes we want to look at. So we've got to look at all of those and say, well, then what do I need to do in terms of designing new value streams to meet the requirements of those families? What supporting capabilities do we, uh, do we need? And then how are we going to change towards that new state? And I would be suggesting that you would use some sort of capability uplift model for the transformations that you need to do, and some sort of more Kanbanized optimization model for the smaller incremental things. And so I will use both of these in programs. Some places need big new capability, and others need optimization of what they're currently doing. And then you can organize those into a roadmap of releases. So you can see four different releases there. And my theme might be reliable IT for a start, and then I want to work a little bit more smart, and then I want to be a bit more agile and adaptive, and then I want to be integrated with the business. And we'll call that release four plus, 
okay? So I can color code that, stick that up on a wall on a, on a big piece of paper or a poster and plot our progress as an organization. And then I can turn that into something a little bit more detail, yeah? So these are the things that we're going to do. So, a bit of a, a wild ride down the rabbit burrow for, for half an hour. Um, some things to reflect on. So firstly, understanding the digital aspirations of your business. If you don't know that, go read the annual report. This, this is, it's a wonderful font of, of intent, right? Annual reports, there's lots of good stuff under About Us. Your business is already advertising that out, that out to their customers, right? And then once you've informed yourself of that, go have a conversation with the digital team. What are my current and future service families? How am I doing things now? How might I do things in the future? So is my operating model and its constituent value streams ready and fit for purpose? What work do I need to do? How can I leverage IT for IT tools and emerging frameworks to accelerate IT capability? So there's a lot of useful uh, content out there already. And then the main thing I'd like to, uh, to, 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 to sort of end this with is the future-proof problem is more about you. Are you working on the system or are you working in it? Are you just doing every piece of work that comes to you in a queue or are you standing back from it and understanding how the system works? This is really obvious when you start to work with continuous delivery in DevOps where you're working on the tool chain and seeing the results you get, yeah? Because most of it's automated, it becomes much more, much more obvious. But there's always, a, there's always a, 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 a continuum here between, well, should I be doing 50-50? Should I be doing 80-20? Should I be doing 95-5? What is it? And it will depend a little bit on your level in the company. But that's how you're future-proof. That's really what it's about. And I'd like to leave you with the thought that as leaders, improving our work is our work. That's actually what we're supposed to be doing, yeah? And if you're in an architecture role, you're a head of some function or a head of IT, then improving the current state is what it's all about. If we find ourselves turning up every day and working through the backlog, we're not enjoying our work. It's not the creative work we were born to do. And on that note, I'll, I'll leave those thoughts out there for you. And that last little saying there, don't go with the flow, be the flow. I'm from Value Flow, and the goat's all about curiosity. So be the goat. Okay, thank you. Dave. That was excellent. Uh, so rich content. Thank you. So I'm going to take this opportunity to invite Andrew back up to the stage. Dave, have a seat, and we'll get into a nice discussion with Rob uh, moderating the questions. I think I see that about 30% of you came in after we announced that we do have a way for you to enter your questions. Just use your laptop or your mobile phone and go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com and then it just pops up one field for you to fill out, which is our event code, OG for Open Group, AMS for Amsterdam. So once you do that, you can get in and select this IT Management Professionals Day, and then the questions will go to our speakers now and for the rest of the day. So we can see those as they come in. Feel free if you have questions now still for our two speakers to get started doing that. And Rob, I'll invite you to, yeah, you. to start engaging with those questions. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew and David, for the presentations. We only got about five minutes prior to the break, but let me start with a question for you, Andrew. It's about uh, value chains, value streams are a powerful tool, but you see a lot of discussion nowadays in the market about the capability models. So why is capability or a concept of capability not part of the operating model in your, in your case? Um, oh, I've got my, yes, my microphone is on. Uh, this has been a bit of a struggle for me um, over the last three years, thinking about capability models and, and, um, um, and value chain maps. And is there a concept of a capability chain which is different from a capability model and different from a value chain? Um, I'm afraid I haven't resolved this, um, set this terminology issue completely in my own mind yet, but I... I'm fairly convinced that one of the dangers of the way capability models are used is typically you put, formulate the strategy, you know, do the governance, 
uh, comes at the top of the model, and then there's sort of various sort of boxes, which are sort of the, 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 the work that has to be done to deliver value, and then there's some supporting activities often at the bottom is how long. And I, my concern about that is it doesn't put the work that has to be done to deliver value as the most important thing in people's thinking. And uh, I, I increasingly feel that I focus on what has to be done to deliver value and then worry about all the other stuff is, is critical. And hence, I prefer a capability chain or value chain or service stream or high-level process map as a starting point. OK, thank you. Then, David, a question for you. You propose that IT5T is a unifying framework rather than, rather than the latest buzzword like hybrid bimodal, and uh, that IT5T is a framework for bimodal. So are they actually the same concept in your proposal? Or are they saying different things? Um, I, th I think uh, it's possible to resolve all the different service families onto the one construct of the IT operating model. And so uh, multimodal, multi-speed, yeah, I think, I think that's really where it's headed because the, uh, the e-commerce example, you know, back in 99, 2000, just showed us we stood up another organisation and then we folded it back in. Um, and so there's, there's no, th 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 there are plenty of reasons to be temporarily bimodal. I can understand that because we might have reacted too slowly in IT, for example, and the business has had to go its own way. I, don't, I actually don't really like the term shadow IT because it tells the business that it's done a naughty thing. Um, and I think that's a little bit uh, prescriptive or, or judgmental from the IT function. The business does what the business needs to do and therefore bimodal is a thing. Uh, but I think if we got ahead of the curve, we could have done a better job already, and I don't think there's any reason why we shouldn't resolve those things together fairly soon. Certainly, at the DevOps Enterprise Conference, where I'll be in San Francisco in a couple of weeks' time, it's just, it's DevOps now, you know, in that case, and there's a lot of big enterprises that are doing things as the IT function. Okay, thank you. Can yeah, I make a comment on that? Yes, please, very Good. quickly. Um, I, I think this, this uh, how do you deal with the new stuff is, is is it a perennial business issue completely outside of IT as well as within IT? Um, Clayton Christensen, the, the guru on, on innovation, has always argued you should start things off separately, and the innovator's dilemma and all is, is arguing for that. But there are lots of examples, and um, I'm thinking of the online delivery service for groceries, um, it, where, where actually the, the people who decided to pick the stuff out of the store and then put it on a truck and send it to you were more successful than the people who started separate uh, online uh, businesses. So it, it depends. Right. And, and it really is worth thinking through carefully. Okay, then, then a question, David, for you is about why do organizations need to have a separate IT department uh, as the world most digitized nation abolished its IT ministry for about five years ago? So why do we need an IT department still? That's such a great question. It's a great question. I've actually got uh, a customer that's the Australian energy market operator that runs all of the, uh, all of the utilities uh, operations and runs all the transactions on the network. They took the IT department away and they put it back to the most appropriate places within, uh, within the business functions. And uh, that's working quite well. And uh, you know, we've actually put the IT operating model sort of it's woven through uh, the business model. And, and that's working quite well. Uh, typically, there's a, arguments for economies of scale and, and, and scope and, and skills, you know, centers of excellence, those sorts of ideas. Um, I, I think the argument for it being decoupled and isolated and commoditized to the extent where it can be outsourced, I, I just I can't deal with those arguments any, anymore. You throw things over the fence and you send control of your business process to somebody else. And so I, I think it is more about, on the continuum, going closer and closer to the business and, and integrating more and more. Yeah, I guess then uh, in the line of business, they get a sort of IT function. I mean, uh, and if you source it to another vendor, would that be a kind of IT function? So maybe you shouldn't call it a department, but it's a function within the business. Uh, um, yeah, another question for you, Andrew. It's about what is the role of the business to develop this IT operating model? I don't think the business typically is very competent. <laughs> uh, so I, I think it's the role of the IT leadership. I think the business has to give the IT leadership some design principles, which comes from the business strategy. Um, so there's a dialogue between the business and the IT leadership to agree the design principles for the IT operating model. But 
um, in the same way that what's the role of the customer in, um, in you know, helping Tesco develop their operating model. You know, it, they're, they're relevant input, but they're not the leaders of the process. Right. Thank you. Uh, there was a comment about uh, the flow, feedback, and freedom slide that was used, uh, but the slides were very fast. Uh, could you expand on how the framing helps focus on the development of the IT operating model and delivering value to the business? Mm. I, I think um, one of the key metrics that's been missing in, um, in, in IT is that the, the idea of flow. And I think um, uh, Charlie Betts put a slide up uh, a, a few events ago that showed all the cues from left to right in the IT function. And um, I, I, I think uh, if there's a perishability of value and if we, uh, and the economic cost of delay, which is one of Reinertsen's things, if we don't know those things, if we're not focused on the left to right, um, then I don't think we know what we're actually doing. I, I actually think we're, we're flying blind as an IT function if we don't know the work. I actually did some work with one of the banks in Australia recently, and it had taken them six months of Skunk Works activity to figure out how they did a release on the mobile app. Right? Just butcher's paper all the way down the wall, and then looking for the sources of waste and improvement. It, it, it's, it's fundamental to our understanding of what we're doing for the business, is understanding the left to right work. It's probably the most important step forward to get away from the functional view of the world. Okay, thank you. Yeah, looking at the time, final question is about, um, it says here that most organizations still believe in improving the run, running the IT business, but strategy and design is still taking a back seat. Um, how do you think we cha need to change this perception? Or do you even see that in the perception today? Well, uh, I, and let me go first, um, being a strategy person, so I would say it's a bit the, the golden circles. You've got to start with the, uh, you know, what, what are you trying to do and why? Um, and so uh, a lack of thinking about that is, going to make it very hard to have a good operating model and that's going to make it very hard to optimize the run. Um, uh, and yes, you have, you, you have to get the um, permission to, to, uh, to, to invest in, in change and therefore you have to demonstrate that you can run your existing model reasonably well. So you, yes, you've got to be reasonably efficient at what you're, how you're doing it currently. But unless you do the strategy work and the, uh, and the operating model design work, you can never make those breakthrough performance gains. Okay, and just, just to add on to that, I mean, the, the run has had a fair bit of polishing and it's still not great because we're not building in the support models and requirements yeah. upstream. You know, we don't, I, I do this thing called the path to production, trying to organize, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's um, so we're just gonna go out of business if we just keep polishing the run. Um, requirements to deployment is, is, the, is the place. The execution speed is probably what we need. Now we're, you know, we have digital disruption underway, the ability to execute is something the business is going to be much more interested in than whether you're getting an extra 0.01 uptime on some mission critical services. Yeah, They want that too, by the way. That's the problem. <laughs> okay. okay, Andrew, David, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.